So our image for today is right here. This is a picture taken by uh, Michael Belk, who will be here the latter part of July, the photographer for all of these pictures behind me here, this fine art. It is a picture of uh, a figure of a man uh, representing Jesus, who is in an ancient town in Italy, and he is speaking to a woman who is leaning against a well, obviously a representation of the woman at the well in John chapter 4, a Samaritan woman at that. And she is preoccupied with uh, perhaps her own vanity. That's what he's wanting to convey to us. And they're going to have a conversation about living water. And Jesus um, and his interaction with this woman is a wonderful backdrop for Colossians chapter 3. And we're going to look at Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. So look at that image from time to time in the midst of this message that will help you maybe solidify what is sought to be communicated here this morning. Let's put our hand on our Bibles. Father, may this word make its way into our heart. And out of the abundance of our heart, may our mouth speak. And when we speak, may your word not return void. May this word make our way into our mind. That we would act in accordance with the truth and glorify you in word and in deed. Anoint our ears to hear your word in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk to you today about how we handle our relationships. Our relationship with ourself, our relationship with others, and our relationship with God, and our relationship also with the church. That's a mouthful, but we'll attempt to do it. Let's get inside the head of this woman, a Samaritan woman, a loose woman, a woman who has uh, had numbers of men, um, a woman that is ostracized by her peers. No one would really talk with her. In fact, you find her going to the well at a time of the day when it's hottest, and not when the regular women, the regular women, go to the well early in the morning. She is one that not many will talk with. Many have gossiped about this woman, this woman let's face it. I'm sure she was the talk of the town. Gossip, probably one of the most un misunderstood, underrated, murderous things that can happen to anyone, gossip. Gossip in the Bible is listed among some very, very heinous sin in the book of Romans. And then all of a sudden this word gossip appears because it is so very deadly. She was the probably recipient of much gossip in her town. Was she alone? Yes. Was she lonely? One would gather, yeah. Not a leap of faith to draw that conclusion that she was both alone and lonely, and there is a difference. She needed help, and... Uh, Pretty much all she got, you can tell, if you read between the lines, is judgment. Did she walk in shame with a sense of less thanness? Probably. You would, you would think that. Could she change her past if she could? Yeah, my guess is she probably would. It probably cost her a great deal. Can she change her past? No, she cannot. Did her past rob her of a future? Uh, yet to be seen. Did your past rob you of a future? Well, that's yet to be seen. It depends on what you do with this relationship with Christ. You know, and she's probably the victim of a lot of alliances. You know what alliances are? Groups of people that gather against another person or another group. This, you, family psychologists talk about systems and families. Families have systems where within a family, there are alliances, there are factions that group against one another. I don't know if you have this in your family. It's a fairly common thing. I'm sure she was the victim of many alliances. Uh, people's perceptions of her uh, turned out probably to be love blockers and people mockers. When you have a perception of someone apart from the person, that perception becomes a reality. That reality is not always the reality. It's just a perception that becomes a reality. But she couldn't really receive love nor give love for the perceptions and the conclusions that were drawn about the woman. That's, pretty, that's a pretty fair assess assessment. And the separation that this woman experiences is a real killer. It really is. To be cut off from your own people, to be separated. It's like solitary confinement, but emotional solitary confinement. Physical solitary confinement. Spiritual solitary confinement. 
The, the same sense you get with the woman with the issue of blood in Mark chapter five. Cut off from her own people, but in her own people. In them, but not of them. In them, but not with them. In them, but not understood. She's separate for sure. And this separateness uh, is essential. People who get picked off from the body of Christ in a spiritual sense are vulnerable, to say the least. Now, having said all of that, we come to this Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 through 14. So if you don't mind, out of reverence for God's word, let's stand and let's all read this together. Paul said to his younger son in the faith, Timothy, don't neglect, he said, don't neglect the public reading of scripture. So that's what we're gonna do. All right, let's read this together. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. You may be seated, beautiful. All right, now when you come to a book, you know I say this all the time, but you gotta repeat things. Redundancy is a law of learning as far as I'm concerned. When you come to a passage of scripture, don't make the mistake of diving right in. You gotta know what you're looking at. Colossians is an epistle. What's an epistle? Epistle is a letter written by who? Paul, the apostle, who once was Saul, is totally against Christianity. He met Jesus on the road to Damascus, where you could go today and probably be in the midst of a civil war. And he, he wrote to this church in Colossae about Christ who's the head of the body. So in the context of Colossians, we're reading about what Jesus has to say about his body. Anybody from Corpus Christi, Texas? Corpus Christi, the body of Christ. If you wanna know where the body of Christ is, it's down there in the southern border of Texas. <laughs> and it's here too, isn't it? So he's talking about the church, the head of the church Christ is talking about. It. And he has this beautiful passage in there. And then he says this word in verse 12, therefore, comma, all right, whenever you're reading the Bible, trying to get something out of the Bible, as soon as you see that word therefore, you go, put on the brakes. Stop right there. That means that what I'm about to read after the word therefore is based on what was said previously. So you're not gonna understand, nor am I, what is gonna follow therefore unless we go before the therefore. So let me read before the therefore to you to so get the context of what we're talking about here. He says, since then you've been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, so heart and mind. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Now he says this, verse five. Put to death, strong words. Put to death, very strong, I get it. Whatever belongs to your earthly nature, Put to death anything that belongs to your earthly nature, and he lists them. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways and in the life you once lived. But now, you must also rid yourself of such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other either, since you have taken off your old self with its practices, and put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator. Here, here, the, here there is no Jew or, or Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Okay, he says you used to have this evil nature, earthly nature, he said put it to death. And therefore, he says, and that's dying of that old self, and the putting away of the old self, and the sanctifying of the old self, and the moving on into maturity, into growing up as a disciple, he says therefore, he says, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. God's chosen people. I've done a lot of teaching in this church on predestination, election, and chosen. And to avoid a, a church split and a street fight after the service, you can go listen to those later. But... The idea here is that we are each chosen. I, I personally believe that God chose everybody. The question is, have they chose him? We are God's chosen people, and we are dearly loved, and we're called to be holy. 
Now, what does this mean? This means that you and I, not out of any effort of our own, but as a result of the in, in, invasion of God in our life, in this abrupt intervention of God in our life, this infusion of the Spirit of God in our life, without huge effort, ought to be living in such a way that we're growing towards holiness. This is called sanctification. It's one of these $5 Christian words. It means that you're growing up, okay? Growing up spiritually. And we ought to be holy, set apart. There ought to be something that someone looks at us and they don't see the world. They look at our lives and they see a smile. You don't look like you've been sucking on a lemon for a year. They ought to see joy in our life. They ought to see holiness, cleanliness, innocence, a lack of shame, a presence of confidence. They ought to see something in our life that says, wow, you're, you're kind of different. Wow, I, you don't run into people like you all the time. Wow, is that really what Christianity is all about? Give me some of that. That's holiness, okay, my interpretation. So he says, if you want to be holy, if you want to be understand the fullness of the chosenness that you have, how valuable you are in the eyes of God, you want to live this kind of life, he says, then you're going to have to get dressed. He says you're going to have to clothe yourself. Now, what do we mean by this? I got up this morning, which is about all I could do this morning, and I walked into my closet and I said, well, most of what I own is dirty. You ever feel that? Like, Man, this is, I'm at the bottom of the barrel here. I, like, I was $100 dry, dry cleaning a few months ago, and I, I haven't been back. What am I going to wear? And I picked something out. You picked something out. You picked out the shirt you have on or the blouse you have on or the dress. Some of you feel good in what you have on. Others of you, you know, ready to go home and change. Some of you look good in what you have on. Others of you, we wish had changed before you got here. <laughs> but you picked that out. With some level of intentionality, you pick that out to clothe yourself, correct? It's some reflection of you. It's a reflection of your taste. It's a, it's a reflection of how you want to present yourself. I want to present myself today with this green tie on. I don't know why, but I do. And, and that's, I wore this sport coat because this shirt's too big for me, to be honest with you. <laughs> and I had a pair of socks on that I had to change because one of the heels had a huge hole in it. I considered keeping it on because I thought the heel would cover the hole, and then I realized it's possible it wouldn't. So I had to change my socks. That's what I ended up with. With great intentionality, I made a number of choices in a state of nausea to come here today and minister to you. That's what I did. You are intentional about what you put on. If you've got a big presentation, you're trying to close a big real estate deal, or you're going to take a client around, you're going to try to sell a million-dollar house, I mean, you better believe it. You're thinking about what you put on that day. You better believe it. Well, he says, clothe yourself. You want to live this holy life, this set-apart, cool thing going on, this real, authentic Christianity? He says, no, you got to clothe yourself. All right, cool. Clothe yourself. you got to cover yourself. Cover yourself. Uh, the atonement of Jesus Christ, the blood of the Lamb, is a covering. We've got to cover your sin. You, you, want, to, you want to live this life in front of people? and You want to have a really fun life? Well, then you're going to have to cover you have to have your sin covered. You're going to have to clothe yourself in something. You're going to have to make some choices, and you're going to have to put something on over that sin that you have that covers it and renders it useless and weak, and it doesn't ruin your life. You've got to cover yourself by the blood of the Lamb. Because it's there, friend, it's there. Well, the blood's to cover it. He says, confess your sin, and you'll be faithful and just to forgive you of your sin. That's covering. Cover yourself. But he also says, clothe yourselves now with, with compassion. Compassion. That is to say, you go into your spiritual closet in the morning, not the one that you walked into today, and hanging there on the thing is a sport coat or a dress, and on the back of it says compassion. I want to clothe myself in that. I want to put that on me today. Now, some of us are more compassionate than others. Some of us have the gift of mercy, and you should be more merciful and compassionate than others because it's a gift God's given you. I get that. I don't have the gift of mercy. But there are times when it's called to be merciful. And it's called, there are times when it's called to be compassionate. What does compassionate mean? It comes from uh, a visceral kind of inward uh, pain, uh, an inward discomfort, uh, when, when someone else is hurting. I've had a great deal this week of inward discomfort, but it wasn't for anyone else. 
I know this visceral, that's what compassions are your intestines, your insides. They are, they are where you are, the bowels, it says in King James, the bowels of where you feel something for another person. He says, oh, you can put that on. It's a clothing. You can put that on. He says, clothe yourself with compassion. Clothe yourselves with kindness. Kindness. What, you, what do you want someone to say about you? What kind of girl is she? The kind of girl you want around. What kind of man is he? He's the kind of man is very tender. He's a gentle man. That's, that's something you can intentionally put on, Paul is saying, towards this end of holiness in your life. Some of you are mean, probably, more than you're kind. Some of us are irritated more than we're gentle. But he's saying there's a, there's a wardrobe now. This is my point. There's a wardrobe you can, you can put something on. I'm going I'm to give you a tip on how to do that in a minute. He says, clothe yourself with compassion. Uh, clothe yourselves with kindness. Hey, don't over-spiritualize things. I caution you against this. This kindness is like something that just dropped out of heaven, like downloaded from some sort of divine cloud, some divine apple cloud, and God is just like, whoosh, kindness, receive it. Yeah, Okay. You know, I've said this a few times, I'm gonna keep saying it until we get it. We're justified by faith alone, but faith is not alone. We've gotta act. You've gotta act out the kindness that God has given you. Well, what does this mean? We got this thing that we do as a family every now and again, so when I'm with one of my kids, we're at a Waffle House, we will pay someone else's meal anonymously. That's kindness. Just pick somebody out, it doesn't take long. Oh, they, they're broke. Look at the car they're driving. The fact they had to push it in the parking lot, it's a dead giveaway, they ran out of gas. Let's buy them a waffle, right? Kindness. So kindness is something that God has given us, but we have to clothe ourselves with it. We have to act upon it. James the Apostle was big on this. Clothe yourselves with kindness. Clothe yourselves with humility. What is, what is humility? Humility is teachability. Humility says I don't know everything. And humility says I will ask you for correction. When's the last time you asked some, ask somebody for correction? It's quiet in here, isn't it? <laughs> When's the last time you said, hey, listen, I want to sit down. Would you correct me on a few things? you see anything going on in my life that needs correction? And they, you know you're in trouble when they look at your watch. It's like, Ooh, I, don't know if I, have a, I don't know if I have enough time. That's humility. Humility is teachability. You can clothe yourselves in that, okay? And then he says, and, and, and clothe yourselves with gentleness. Gentleness and patience. Man, I've done a lot of world travel. I'm very blessed to have been traveling around the world at very interesting places. But I, when you come back home and you give your passport to customs, the, the thing that always comes across my lips is, oh, thank God I'm home. But at the same time, nowhere else on the face of the earth is there such a lack of patience. Patience, man. Manifested in tailgating. Now I got your attention. We're an impatient people. We're a rushed people. We're a gotta get there people. And you notice this is really funny because those of you who come up here for the summer, you come up here to relax. The rest of us like have jobs. <laughs> and you drive around in your Florida license plates <laughs> and you're looking, oh, look, honey, a uh, beautiful vista. And the guy behind you is like got an appointment to sell a piece of land and he's like, oh, I just want to, I hope they don't go to my church kind of thing. <laughs> we have names for you people. And we love you dearly, and we want, you, we want to be together. I love the friends I've made, but you know, come around Thanksgiving. It's kind of nice, isn't it? Huh? The rest of it, it's kind of nice. Come on, admit it. There's no Florida. There's no Alabama. It's nice. You're like, you're gunning it. You're on two wheels through the mountains. It's awesome. Patience. Well, Galatians 5 and 22 is a verse I want you to write down if you're not familiar with it. If I said Galatians 5, 22 and you don't know the verse, I want you to get familiar with it. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, long-suffering, gentleness and goodness, faith, meekness, and 
self-control, long-suffering, patience, gentleness. This is a fruit of the Spirit. But here's my point, and this is Paul's point, I believe. If you want to live this holy, cool, awesome, authoritative, effectual, infectious life, then you got to make some choices on what to wear. Now, I would encourage you to do the following. You get up in the morning, and basically, we get dressed every morning, I hope. And do you get spiritually dressed? That's the question. I know you put on whatever you put on and go, go meet today, but are you spiritually clothed? Because oftentimes we're not. And I think if you've got a, and I've got, a deficiency in any of these areas, it would do us well to put something on. Now, I, I've even gone so far at different areas in a time in my life when I was growing up in Christ when I first, I would put a bracelet on. And that bracelet, or I put a rubber, da- a rubber band around my wrist, and every time I looked down at that, it would remind me that I, that's a reminder. I'm, today I'm clothed in humility. Today I'm clothed in compassion. Today I'm clothed in gentleness. And, it, and it's an intentional wardrobe that you put on that makes you mindful of the fact that today I'm dressed in humility. And you go out into your day with the intentionality now with the intentionality of taking some halfway decent sermon on a Sunday and making it a manifestation of the Spirit of God on your Wednesday morning. There is a huge difference between sitting there and listening to someone speak and acting upon the Word of God and enjoying the blessing of serving, of ministering, of encouraging someone else as a result of that message. That's, those two things are two different things. Not looking for Sunday morning Christians in this church. I'm looking for Saturday night Christians who took that message the previous week or something they found in the Word, something you heard on the radio, whatever it may be, and you're acting upon it now. Okay, so if you're weak in uh, compassion, why not put something on this week? Get up in the morning and you put something on. Maybe it's a bracelet, maybe it's some, some reminder. And you say, no, 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 this morning I'm clothed in compassion. What does that mean? I'm mindful of the fact that wherever I go today, I'm going to start trying. I'm going to get consciously aware of the fact that I'm going to start looking at people as God looks at them. I'm going to start looking at people as God looks at them. I'm going to start looking at people that are ostracized, alienated, alone, have no fellowship as God looks at them. I'm going to stop judging if I, if I judge, and I'm going to start hurting for people. That's compassion. I'm welcoming, by that morning's dress, I'm welcoming the intentionality of, hopefully by day's end, being bothered that someone else is hurting. I'm seeking the discomfort of caring for another person. That's clothing. And I'm going to wear it all day long. I am maybe full of myself. I'm going to get up in the morning, I'm going to put on humility, and I'm going to find out how I can learn something from someone else. I'm going to seek someone out who knows more than I do about something, or is who one of the few people on this mountain who will sit down looking down and tell you what they feel. And believe me, there are not many of them. I'm going to sit down and look someone in the eye and get them to tell me what they're actually feeling. Man, what a blessing that would be. Clothed in humility. I'm going to somehow realize that I could be a little more gentle. I'm going to put something on that morning that's not going to push people away, but it's going to engage them. i got to watch my words in the meditations of my heart. There's an intentionality to getting dressed in the morning spiritually that makes you mindful of the fact that you, like me, are deficient in areas that where we need to maybe bring it up a notch towards holiness, towards freedom, towards Christ, towards the Spirit. And we've got to get dressed, you see. And that's the thing, and sometimes it's just a prayer. And about noon, when you forgot you had it on, Oh, that's right, Lord, I'm back. I'm back to being teachable. You might find out you learn a lot that day. You might find out you care a lot that day. You might be surprised who crosses your path. 
you might be surprised who crosses your path who's really hurting, who really needs someone to encourage them. Intentionality. We must, wait a minute, I gotta make sure I'm using the right words here. Yeah, why not? We must be more intentional about our spiritual garb than we are our physical garb. And failure to do so, we will have a poor relationship with ourselves. And if we have a poor relationship with ourselves and we don't love ourselves, then we have the difficulty loving others, for we love others as we love ourselves. We have a poor relationship with the Lord because we're hearing his word, but we're not doers of it. Intentionality. It's a simple thing. Put something on your body tomorrow that makes you aware of the fact that you're intentionally seeking to walk in compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, or patience. Or the alternative, don't. Forget about it. Let this verse pass you by. Don't do anything about it. You might as well leave now. Go. Forget it. It's just a nice verse. And you'll have to find something to do before the U.S. Open starts. But basically, you know, it's one or the other. And i got to do the same thing. Now, if we're weak in a certain area, don't try to bring all your weaknesses up to your strength. It'll never happen. And people make this mistake all the time. They try to be someone other than who they actually are. Like, if you're really, really weak in an area, don't expect that real weakness to be up in par with your current strength. Because what's happened is, one, it never makes it, and two, your strength never gets stronger. If you run companies, you know what I'm talking about. Get in your lane and stay in your lane, but clothe yourself in these things so that you can be strengthened to the point where you're aware of the fact you have these deficiencies and you can learn and grow. That actually wasn't bad advice. Bear with each other. Uh, some of your King James says, forbear with one, one another. Now, notice the word each other. Now, who's he talking to? The church. Bear with each other, he says. Uh, An echo in Greek, it means uh, to hold up, hold firm, hold one another up. So I want to go over a few one another's here in the Bible that I think are really important to think about. Now, if one of these stands out to you and you go, man, that ain't me, we'll put it on tomorrow. Wear it. Be mindful of it. When I say put on a spiritual garb, like I put on a spiritual compassion, I don't mean just like in the morning say, well, Lord, give me, make me more compassionate, and then put that on and forget about it. I'm saying, like, get the Bible out. Here's an idea. Get the Bible out and start studying the word compassion. Get the Bible out and start looking at where people showed compassion. Wonder why Jesus looked at the crowds and had such compassion on them. He wept. Make yourself a student of compassion. That's wearing something, you see. Make a week out of it. But trust me, you're not going to become so compassionate you need to stop. Okay? Make, make, a, make an event out of it, you see. That's intentionality in Scripture. Like, maybe I'm not as gentle. Maybe I'm not as compassionate as I need to be with my family members. Well, okay, well, put that on, and now get, become a student of it, you see. That's doing something. In our culture, we must operate with intentionality. And it fits into the church big time. And this is why he says one another. Now, some of you go to different churches. Some of you just blew into town. Whatever, wherever you go to church. If you don't go to church, you should be in a church because the word says you should be in a church. Hebrews 10, 25. He says, accept one another. You find this in Romans 15 and 7. Accept one another. Too often, we find ourselves in trouble relationally in the church because we expect someone to be other than where they are. Well, accept where they are. Accept them. Wherever you start, that's where you start. We all finish at the same place. God carries on to completion that which he started until the day of Christ Jesus, Philippians 1. So accept where you are. I just got back from India with Jeremy. Now he, he was telling me about a sermon. He sat right there, as a matter of fact, some, some year or so ago where he stood up and he accepted Christ and now he's, now he's in India. 
Okay, well, accept, you know, that's where he was and this is where he is. Cool, nice. I enjoyed getting to know him. I enjoyed hearing his heart. But we're all at a different place. Accept one another, he says. Then he says, uh, Colossians 3 and 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another. Correct one another. Point things out to one another. Build one another up. Push one another forward. That should be part of your uh, life in, in Christ in the church. If you're an island unto yourself, if you're not engaging, you're not in relationship, you're not at a point of comfortability with other people in the body of Christ where you can point something out they're doing wrong or you can encourage them, that, hey, you're not in the right one another. Put that on, will you? Get, dress, dress yourself in that. Carry each other's burdens, Galatians 6 and 2. Carry one another's burdens and in so doing fulfill the law of Christ. Here we're back to Compassion. You put that on in the morning, you start getting the word out and say, you know what, I'm not really burdened for anybody. I don't really care about anybody. I'm kind of like doing my own thing. Well, that's not good. Carry one another's burdens. Look for burdens. You know, draw boundaries. My gosh, the people will eat you alive. But you know what I'm saying? That's another sermon. <laughs> you better believe it's another sermon. Carry someone's burden. Encourage one another. First Thessalonians 5 and 11. Oh my gosh, we all need at times to be encouraged. Oh, Barnabas, we need Barnabases in our life and we need to be a Barnabas. Put on Barnabas' sport coat tomorrow. Put on a pair of jeans that Barnabas had and go, go encourage people. Be intentional with that tomorrow about whoever you meet or whoever you see or some stranger, who, someone you buy a soda from, someone who waits on your table. Let me encourage you. Let me build you up. Man, put that on with some intentionality. Do it for a week. It'll feel good. If you lack in that area, put that on. Build one another up, Romans 14 and 19. Build one another up in the most holy faith. Call someone out of the blue. Facebook somebody. Had you on my mind today. Got my encouragement sport coat on. Don't tell them that. We don't have a clue what you're talking about. Here's a verse. Care for one another so that you should... There should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. There's this thing going on in the body of Christ today, and I think in this church too, and there always is. There's a battle over music. We don't sing enough hymns. The music's too loud. It's not loud enough. Can we ever see anything contemporary? And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, man. Or do we accentuate youth too much at the expense of the seniors? Or it's always, There's always that going on. It's, it's crazy. It's hard to do. It's a very hard thing to do. And sometimes things get out of balance. We want to build up the youth or the future of the church, but at the same time, it's a never-ending thing. And it's just a reality, and that's the way it is. It's not, that, it's not bad. It's just a thing. It's the way it is. But care for one another. We have to care for one another so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. 1 Corinthians 12 and 25. Comfort and encourage one another, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 18. Confess your sins. Here you go. There's a, there's a verse in James 5, 16. It talks about the sick. He says, the sick come and, I don't know why people don't do this more often. I need to encourage you. I need to encourage you to do this. I want to admonish you to do this. I want to build you up in your faith to do this. I don't know why it is this way, but it is this way. Come to the elders of the church. Hey, we've been waiting on you. Confess your sin and, and the prayer and anoint them with oil and the, the prayer of faith will heal the sick. Well, little Ace had a blood disorder. He doesn't have one anymore. He came to the elders of the church. We did what the Bible had to say. He doesn't have it anymore. Someone else came with diabetes. They don't have it anymore. Why we don't do what the word has to say, I don't know. Confess. You should have a relationship with someone in the body of Christ you can confess your sin to. The Catholics got this right. The purging of your guilt, the opening up and confessing of your sin to another person, not just God, is a cool thing. It's in the Bible right here. I'm reading it. James 5. we got to have those kind of relationships in the body of Christ. Be devoted to one another, Romans 12 and 10. What does that mean? It means like we have an alliance with one another, a care, a mutual respect for one another that Here's where we make the mistake in the United States of America. We think that it's the pastor's job to care for everybody. No. 
They're one another's. One another's. There's a lot of one another's. Who in their right mind is going to care for every single person at the expense of their own health and their family? Nobody. It's not even biblical. So we place expectations not upon one another, upon another. Not one another, another. And you end up being disappointed. Let me say that again. Not on one another, on another. (laughs) And you end up disappointed. And you should be. Greet one another. Be honest with one another. Honor one another. Be hospitable to one another. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Love one another. Be of the same mind with one another. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus. Serve one another. Submit to one another. Spur one another on. I love that verse. Spur one another on. It's like a a horse. Spur one another on. Yes, you can do it. Go. Get it. Get the deal. Get the job done. Ask her out. Whatever it is, do it. You can do it. We need that in the body of Christ. The disproportionate expectation upon a few to meet the needs of many is, shall I say, ridiculous. Forgive one another if you have a grievance against someone. Huge, huge. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. How did he forgive us? Thoroughly. Conclusively, and what I call 490 forgiveness. 70 times 7. 490 forgiveness. Let it go. Forgiveness. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. The healthy, fully functioning church operating on all cylinders, is, is meeting, is, is, an, is an amazing, mysterious thing. It is a mystery. How a fully functioning, healthy church is what it is, is a mystery. Because it's not the work of man. It's the work of the Spirit. Now what does it look like? The church grows in number, reaches more people with the gospel, has more of an influence outwardly from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Look at this church. Ministering in Jerusalem, reaching people in Franklin, in Sapphire, in Cashers, in Cullowee, in Western North Carolina, in Silva, all the way across the world. That's, that's healthy that the church does that. But what makes it a mystery of how it happens is not at the expense of the intimacy of the people in the church congregation. Both are to happen. Not one is to be sacrificed at the expense of the other. We're not called to be a holy huddle that never reaches people. That's called death and bankruptcy. But at the same time, we're not called to reach everybody at the expense of our own people. That's called foolishness. Now, how do both of those things happen at the same time? You have to have vision, you have to have resources, you have to have prayer, and you have to have each other's. Every person has to intentionally be a part of the body of Christ, the Corpus Christi, with the intentionality that there's a one another thing going on in each of our lives. Looking out for one another, encouraging one another, admonishing one another, building one another up, spurring on one another, praying one for another. That's the way it's supposed to happen. The church expands and grows, as this one is. It expands and grows in resources, as this one is. Our giving last year was the largest giving in the history of the church, and we're ahead of that this year. But never is it supposed to be at the expense of the people in the church. You see how the mystery works together. Not one or the other. Both are bad if isolated from one another. Isolation is not good. Compassion is. Here's a woman, and the only person on the face of the earth that would speak to her is Christ. And he was more interested in the world being reached than anyone because he died for them. He sat and listened to the entire testimony of a woman with the issue of blood while a 12-year-old guy was, girl was dying. He understood the outreach of the church, 
but he also understood the individual. Now in God's economy, this is the mystery. This particular church needs to get on board with something. And that's this. In God's economy, in God's church, he had people that were being neglected. In other words, they weren't being cared for so that there would be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If there's a disproportionate concern for one another, needs aren't being met emotionally, spiritually, financially. Whatever those needs are, I don't know. If they're not getting met, the potential is for division, says the Word of God. God's answer to that was this. Establish in the church. Please listen to me because most of you have not listened to this point. In fact, I would say zero if you have listened. Zero. Because not one person has answered. In God's economy, the individual needs are not to be overlooked, but nor is the outreach of the church. And when people's needs were being overlooked, he instituted, and I'm going to say a word that has a connotation to you based on your history, and I really don't care what your history is. I care what this book has to say about it. He established deacons to make sure that the one and others were taken care of. He did it so that others would neglect the preaching of the word. Now, what really needs to happen here is we need to be biblical in everything we do. And the question is, are there, and the elders have talked about this, both men and women, based on the deaconess in the Bible, are there men and women in this church who meet the qualifications of a deacon or a deaconess who are willing to help facilitate the one and others? That's a calling. That's a mantle. That's important. You need to think about that. It's very important. Ephesians 4 and 3, make every effort. I love those three words. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Psalm 133 and 1, oh, how good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. It's like the oil. I love the oil. <laughs> it's like the oil poured over the head. Acts 2 and 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. I love the fact that they shared their possessions with one another as they had need. After the verses we've looked at this morning, he says this, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful, he says. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another in all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Look at your family. Look at your business. Look at your witness in the community. Look at your church. How might you appropriately dress this week to be mindful of the area that you are open to an increase? that we may walk in holiness and separateness from the world and enjoy the favor of God.